Yeah, we've got three pastures and a pretty decent sized forest. Of fir, pine mixed conifer? Uh, mostly maple. Uh, we're, maple. we're in maple syrup country here and we oh, have right. uh, quite a number of maple trees. It, I mean, my my wife, my partner wants to make maple syrup. You kind of need uh, a good boiler, but we certainly have enough trees to produce quite a bit of maple syrup. If that's not Fantastic. stereotypically can... Canadian, I don't know what is. <laughs> but maybe you can use the boiling vats to make alcohol, like in off season or something. I don't know, you know. <laughs> there must uh, be people locally who figured out how to do that. <laughs> maple rye. Well, it's uh, nice. <laughs> right. It's time for the Access of Easy Podcast. It's nice to uh, be on the triumvirate again. I was. I'm happy that you, uh, Mark, that you, you know, had some variety in the show. Uh, the, the guests and stuff I thought those were you know valuable and useful so but it's kind of nice I I, uh, I I need to spark off you guys every once in a while just to kind of you know stay in the loop well it's good to be back let me do a quick intro it's salon number yeah. 21 with the band is back together the boys are back in town I could grab a thin Lizzie audio clip and then we get demonetized again on YouTube Jesse Hirsch, Charles Hugh Smith, I'm Mark Jeftovic, and we are back, and we're recording this on September the 10th, 2020. What do you guys want to talk about? Well, I thought there was a lot of uh, good topics uh, for exploration in Jesse's last piece about um, the, we underestimate how much data uh, the smartphones are collecting and how it, and, and how it can be used. And so my joke email to Jesse was, um, if I stop using my phone, my screen time plummets, then the psychiatric app is going to assume <laughs> I'm depressed or possibly psychotic. And so it's going to um, shut off my uh, access to my Honda Civic because, you know, I'm no longer a safe driver. <laughs> and so, but that's, that's entirely plausible, right? I mean, if, if you take it to the limit. And then I sent you guys a link to... Um, kind of a long uh, essay about the idea that some service like Twitter could be owned by the users. It's, it's, it, in other words, it's not an IPO that goes public and, and it's um, a cash out in the billions. It's actually owned by the, the users. And it was kind of a convoluted scheme because that's late stage capitalism for you, right? <laughs> the only thing that's really easy is you know to make banks and and uh, speculators billions anything less than that then you're going to get into a lot of complications but i thought those were two ideas i, I wanted your guys hits on i'm definitely going to write about the latter next week i appreciated that article and it definitely fits with some other thoughts i've had in terms of uh, alternative infrastructure all an alternative uh, uh industry I, I don't want to use the word competition because it's like apples and oranges but you know, a cooperative model to social media, a cooperative model to digital infrastructures, sort of fits our recurring theme around protocols versus platforms. And right. you know, I, I, I was gonna uh, try to revisit that last week. I mean, yesterday and today, my head has been uh, wrapping around uh, GPT-3, which is the latest uh, offering from OpenAI. And it's an interesting, kind of example of natural language processing and sort of where it's pushing. And my interest is in, in it is not so much the technology or what it's capable of, but the philosophical and existential discussions that it's spawning, both uh, uh, on its own, but in connection to what we've been talking about all along, which is the kind of fall of the American Roman Empire and anticipating what comes next in its broader 
geopolitical orbit. But at the same time, you know, what I've missed uh, in, in the few weeks, Charles, since you and I have been together or that the three of us have been together is kind of thinking about the broader economics that we're going through right now. I mean, the stock market has at least fallen a little compared to the exuberance that we saw over the summer. And I, I feel I'm starting to get a greater sense of what's happening from a, 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 a economic, a political economic perspective. And, you know, that's where really I tend to look up to the two of you guys in terms of having more knowledge and expertise in that area. But it, it's it's something I wouldn't I, I'm we may touch upon today in terms of, you know, can we get a greater sense beyond the hype, beyond the stock market as a representation of a rigged economy of where the actual economy is going and, and what we need to do to anticipate that. At least that's where my interests are presently beyond sort of the day to day of what I'm writing. There's a lot of good sources out there that I follow that that cover that kind of thing all the time. Not, I mean, not the least of which is Charles's writings almost every day using actual FRED data. But there are others out there like the Grant Williams podcast. He's got three separate channels in there. Um, there's another guy named um, uh, what? What's oh George Gammon? And he does these whiteboard videos on YouTube that kind of like explain these flows and stuff. But quickly, I'll just interject one thing. Charles, I noticed before we started, there was an article on Zero Hedge that the Fed hasn't bought a bond in a month. And that's to your point that you were thinking they would like pull the air out of the tires before the election to um, <laughs> help. That was my nudge thought. It help nudge it one way or the other. And Jesse, the GPT-3 thing, is this the the article that's gone completely viral, like an artificial intelligence wrote this article and said it would... That was a media stunt that distracts from the substance of the story. Yes. Right, okay. But there's far more to it than that. I would say no, that, I know that, that yeah. has nothing to do with it. Okay. But The Guardian, to give them credit, found a way to create a media stunt that got them a lot of attention but otherwise the connection is to us at best right yeah well you know mark it took me a couple of weeks to get this book but back in the, one of the first uh salons you'd mentioned this book by an academic um on the, the collapse of the soviet union um everything was forever until it was no more right so i finally got that and and um it's an interesting book, you, uh, but the first, say, 20 to 30 pages is academic jargon um, in defense of, obviously, um, the author's uh, claim on, uh, on, on a tenure track uh, faculty <laughs> position, because it's like, you know, one notation after another of obscure other academics, um, you know, postmodernist analysis of speech acts and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it, that was the, the prelude to, you know, um, to the to the subject. And what I found fascinating so far, I'm not finished with the book at all, but was his his um, his description of how we we tend to look at the Soviet Union um, from the West as a binary, you know, like a evil system, people dissenting right and meanwhile he said actually there was a lot of gray area in between where people were living their normal lives and they they didn't necessarily agree with the propaganda or they knew it was fake but they also were not dis dissent uh, they weren't dissenting they were just trying to get on with their normal lives and it made me ask the question to Jesse's point what's it like now in the um, in the equivalent the American Empire or the global economy that's like last stage capitalism you know what's it like for us or what's the kind of binaries and so it's kind of like well to your point jesse too the stock market is one end of the binary like stock market's soaring so it must mean that everything's great and and yet it has so little effect on 95 percent of the population because they don't own any of that uh bubbling up uh assets right and, and we all know it's fake. It's kind of like the equivalent of, of Soviet propaganda, right? The market's always going to go up. The Fed's going to say something dovish, et cetera. And all the central banks are colluding. But it, it as as you say, it, it's actually totally disconnected now from the real world economy. 
And, um, and so this is really a, a great analog to the, the Soviet Union in my mind, because the stock market is like our, you know, late stage capitalism's version of official propaganda. <laughs> it's like nobody really, everybody knows it's fake, it's bogus, it's just a representation of facade you know, to make it seem like we're, we're in prosperity, but nobody really believes it, especially people who follow it, like Mark. Although you bring up an interesting sort of image there, Charles, in terms of, you know, Soviet propaganda used to always be kind of mocked and characterized as being <laughs> the most absurd propaganda because the people of the Soviet Union, never they saw right through it. They knew it was propaganda. Yeah. And yet, when you were describing the stock market as propaganda, it kind of made me think, you know what? Our entire culture is propaganda, right? <laughs> like, whether you think of it as celebrity culture or whether it's the, the, the extent to which cable news is so ludicrous, whether it's Fox News or CNN, whether it's MSNBC or there's any of the others, right? The extent to which they've become so sensationalist, they, they've become the spectacle that they themselves are a kind of Soviet propaganda that everyone knows to be ludicrous and yet still go through the motions because that's the apparatus of the state. There are certain glimpses of, you know, uh, a comedy, for example, I think is the last bastion of not so much the truth, but at least criticism and, and some form of freedom of speech. But, you know, you're evoking the image of Soviet propaganda just made me think that we're living in Soviet propaganda. It so <laughs> permeates and is pervasive in our culture. I, I find mainstream network news so intolerable. I just, I can't even watch it, any of it. And <laughs> there's this guy on Twitter I follow called Sal the Agorist, and he puts out these hysterically on point memes and one one of them was now I'm gonna have to pull it out and edit it into the show but it was a it was like this rudimentary bar graph that says you know public trust levels CNN and gas station sushi and the gas station sushi like was like 31 percent and CNN was like 30 percent it was like <laughs> but what I loved about the book, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, was, well, it was two sides of it. Before, before the Soviet Union collapsed, no one thought it was within the realm of possibility, and I talk about that all the time. But what you, comes out of that book was when it started to happen, and then when it completed, it didn't feel unexpected. It felt like this inevitable outcome. Like, what did you think was going to happen? And what I'm finding crazy now, not crazy, that's a bad word, a, a poor, poorly chosen word. What I find remarkable now is really mainstream, normal people, like my neighbors on the street I live on or, or people who don't follow crazy things that I follow, when I talk to them and say, give them the whole story that I've outlined here about sovereign individual book the whole thesis of the ussr was the first shoe to drop in the collapse of the western empire would be the second shoe to drop and this could be that time this could be that time when it seems unheard of now but in a year from now the united states may not be recognizable as a coherent country it could be something completely different it could be a fractured uh, cracked up balkanization of itself and people I tell that to they don't look at me like I'm crazy they don't think oh it's just Mark you're reading Zero Hedge too much you're 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 being that here you forgot your tinfoil hat I'm, I'm not getting those kind of standoffish looks they're nodding their head and they're saying yeah well did you hear this news story or my friends in New Jersey are doing this and people are fleeing the cities New York and people are fleeing California and and Chicago and it's it's just it's really unbelievable to watch from a distance what is going on right now. I I, I mean on on one hand the literal 
Right? People are fleeing California because the state is on fire. Yeah, I know. I know. It's so just, I mean, I don't mean to laugh. I mean, it's 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 a terrible thing, but it's just like, un. yeah. But that's just it, right? Like when, when you're at that level of kind of biblical scale narratives, and then you contrast that with the golden age of conspiracy, right? In which yeah. the official narrative is so false so faulty, so flawed, so uh, uh, full of, of holes that to fill that void, conspiracy is naturally what people turn to in a way that in previous eras people turn to religion because you need to believe in something. So you might as well believe that there's a cabal of people who are pedophiles, who are molesting kids around the world because at least then you can believe you're fighting something evil and that and you are righteous and gives and, you a sense of purpose. And selling them via coded SKU numbers on Wayfair. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me just interject real quick on the conspiracy theory. I, I don't know if this is true to the same degree in, in, in the European Union countries or, or Great Britain or Canada, but... I think in the U.S., because it's at the, the latest stage of late stage capitalism, is everybody's got a scam or skim running and, and the people are aware of this. In other words, everyone in power or in a position of authority is personally has a stake which has been hidden so that when they test a drug, it turns out they overdose the patients so that the test will fail because they have a stake in a, in a pharmaceutical company. You know, and, and so on and so forth and so this of course has created the golden age of conspiracy because people are catching on that there's always a conspiracy there of yeah. self-interest and so it's 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 impossible to trust anyone now and and, and that's why you know and i i do this in uh, to mark's point of when you're talking to the neighbors but you know this is why i emphasize that it's not a kleptocracy Right, a kleptocracy being a corrupt regime based on theft, in which the elite are robbing everything. That is happening. <laughs> yeah, make but no it's mistake. actually, it's actually we've talked about this previously. A cacistocracy, <laughs> which is ruled by the incompetent. Right. Yeah. That yes, there are looters who are in control, but they're so incompetent at their looting. <laughs> that they're not getting away with it. They're not even that successful. They're just the system, the wheels are coming off. The whole thing is just becoming sabotaged by the sheer greed of the elites who run it, but who are <laughs> incompetent compared to the thieves who ran it before them in that they're not <laughs> able to run that uh, uh, kleptocracy in a sustainable way. They haven't figured out how to do the skim so that the casino keeps running. And instead, the whole thing is coming right off. You know, I don't know if I if I believe that. I, I think they're doing a very good job of enriching themselves. And I think what we are, we're just hitting the end of the runway. And a phrase that's come up several times on today's show is late stage capitalism. I loathe that phrase because, you know, I'm, I'm a free market believer. I'm a capitalist at heart. And I just don't think that what we're living through is is late stage capitalism as much as just late stage something else you know whatever late capitalism stage neoliberalism you, yeah, yeah okay excellent late stage neoliberalism or I failure mean, I, I to launch globalism to elaborate hmm? yeah go I, ahead. I, I want you to briefly elaborate because i am of the late stage capitalism camp along with charles oh i, well, I will as a compromise agree to late stage neoliberalism Okay. But I wouldn't mind you elaborating just a little on your objection from an economic perspective, not a personal perspective. I can do it in one sentence. No bailouts, any company, any reason, ever. That's capitalism. No, that's your capitalism. No, that's actual capitalism. Capitalism is well, no, you get the profits, but you have to take the risks. If you're not taking the risks, it's not capitalism. So that's why I don't call with, the system we're in capitalist. With all due respect, capitalism uh, it can be defined as a lot of things. Yeah. I hope that we could call it a, an ideology, a philosophy, an idea. And if it is any of those three things, that means... 
that a lot of people are going to interpret it differently. Yeah. And insofar as they interpret it differently, no one person can say, here's what it is. Well, no, but I get asked this a lot when people say, okay, well, what if this isn't capitalism, what is capitalist? What would true capitalism look like? And I usually just start right there because most of the times no one will push back on that. No one will say, yeah, I can live with that. Or everyone will say, I, I can live with that. Why because did all those like guys it. get... Yeah, why did all those guys get bailed out in 2008 and I lost my job? Like that, or my I, house. That doesn't make any sense. I, I'm not... I'm not suggesting that your idea isn't uh, interesting, valid, worth supporting. I'm just saying it's your idea. Yeah. So it's Marx capitalism. Okay. And everyone Marx talks to likes it. And, <laughs> and I admit, I'm... You're, you're, you're earning my interest, but it's still your capitalism and not necessarily other people's capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, what we have here, though, let me just interject real quick, is a cap the, when we say late stage capitalism, it's kind of like because that's what the looters, that's part of their facade, is that they're claiming that this is a capitalist system and mm -hmm. that they're winning only because, well, we're, you know, we have the better idea and, and our, we have, um, we've risen in this meritocracy. And they, they don't, you know, and of course, that's a, um, a form of propaganda. Yes. So, we we yeah, built a better mouse. It's just now part of the propaganda. We built a better mousetrap. It's called a central bank. And we sit on the board <laughs> of the central bank. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know, um, I, today, uh, actually, last night, I wrote a piece based on, the, on this book, uh, the, 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 on the Soviet Union's, you know, sort of uh, disillusion, if you will. And I thought one of the points that really struck me that, again, and we're talking about living within a propaganda system that we, we, we um, don't really believe in, but we're not necessarily dissenting. We're just trying to get on with our lives. Everybody thinks that empires collapse because the barbarians, uh, you know, sacked Rome or there's a civil war or some kind of insurrection, you know, the French Revolution kind of model. But the Soviet Union model was is the one I'm most interested in in terms of the U.S. situation, which is people just stop showing up. You know, it's like it's things just stop working because once the psychology of, of the of participants changes, and that's a big part of the book, is is that people had a, a sudden shocking kind of change of awareness, or they were suddenly conscious that this this could in fact collapse or that, that they were actually living in in the initial stages of the collapse and then they started thinking well i need to understand this and um, i need to figure out how i'm going to adapt to this and so um that's i i don't think we're quite y yet there but i can see that potential and i'm getting feedback from people that are saying you know doctors are burning out they're retiring early filing claims going to half time it's already happening yeah, I, I agree. I think it I think it's happening at a scale we don't realize. And I think the warning signs are, are among us. I think mental health response to the pandemic is is one very clear metric, right? People aren't stressed because they could get sick. People are stressed because they don't know how they're going to pay rent and mortgage. Right. And so I, I think a lot of that is already happening. And to your point about things not working, the last two times I went to Craptacular Tire, which is a company here in Canada. That now you're going to get us sued because they're very litigious. Okay, go ahead. I never said their name. I'm talking about Craptacular Tire. I haven't been specific. But the last two times I've been there, you know, I'm very strategic about my shopping. You know, I look online to check the inventory, right? I'm, I know where it is in the store so I can get in and out, no problem. The last two times, the inventory that it said online was available was not available in store. And then today when I was there, I went to, you know, I, I was walking by and there was this frying pan on sale for nine bucks. So I was like, okay, I'll buy two. And then I went to check out, they're like, these are 150 bucks each. And I'm like, but it says $9 in the aisle. And I walked back to the aisle, took a photo and showed them. They're like, nope. The so computer like, literally, says. Their inventory system doesn't work. Their pricing system doesn't work. They can barely retain employees like everyone's quit because why would they work for minimum wage and ex like so i think you're onto something charles i think that the system's already falling apart i think people are already saying forget this i'm getting a van and i'm gonna live in that van and just drive around right or you know I i'm gonna move out to the country or i'm gonna retire early i think there's a lot of people who are just going yeah i'm out of here 
Well, there, there's all kinds of that, and I think it cannot be under or overstated. Sorry, how 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 crucial a change in mass psychology is to these large events. And I remember the global financial crisis, two thousand seven, eight, nine. I had been kind of bracing for that for years, like I was. The, you know the chicken little that's saying there's going to be a crash or agreeing with the people who were saying there was going to be a crash and when it finally happened it surprised even me and what I really remember vividly about that time is the change in psychology which was just a microcosm comparatively to today but when the mood when the when the mass psychology changed from greed to fear it was like we were teleported into a whole new universe. It was it was unrecognizable. And that was just the financial markets. I mean, it bled out to Main Street in its own way, but nothing compared to today. And what happened in March and April was it was just cascading panic. And then, of course, the central banks fired up the printing machines and we just thought all we have to do is print more money and everything will go away. And we, everyone's kind of got this relief in them of like, but that's, I think that is starting to crack a bit again. And I was about to use the word facade. We were talking about the Soviet Union and the, one of the famous parables of the Soviet Union was the Potemkin village, right? And I can't, was it Tsar Nicholas or the one before him about they just put those, he had to visit some place out in the frontier and they just put up those two dimensional houses and he just went down and they stood some people in front and they waved and that that was the vision in my mind when we were talking about cnn and fox and 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 mainstream media it's just yeah it's there's nothing behind it it's just a bunch of well manicured potemkin village yeah and the narrative is a potemkin village it's just a bunch of well manicured talking heads smiling at you saying i don't know flatten the curve and everything's going to be okay and and stay in which line is, which is why the conspiracy theorists are so compelling because they're the chicken littles they're the one who's saying the sky is falling right doom is upon us evil people have control they're coming to put chips in you yeah you know, I, whatever whatever it can be i they're wrestle with i wrestle with i really wrestle with is it, you know, I, I've always been a, re, a near religious devotee of don't blame on conspiracy what you can explain by stupidity, right? It's incompetence is first, <laughs> conspiracy is usually second, and I am having a really hard time clinging to that belief through this through this entire thing. So sometimes I, I kind of sit I'm up late opposite. at night. Really? Okay, tell me about it. Yeah, this, this is pushing me way more into the incompetence camp. Hmm. Like, I'm overwhelmed every day by the sheer level of stupidity and incompetence that I'm seeing. And it, it's gotten to the point that, like, I, I'm so overwhelmed by it, to your point that you feel overwhelmed, you know, by the sense that there's such evil or such looting or such greed happening. I'm like, nobody can I be this... I feel the same this... overwhelming of... I can't believe how fucking stupid and incompetent these institutions and authorities are. I was just about to say institutional stupidity, but it can't be. Like, no one can be this stupid. Ergo, there has to be a bunch of people sitting around a star-shaped table with black candles on the vertexes <laughs> planning it all out. Oh, au, au contraire, mon frère. I, I, think, I think Charles has, has given us the link between our combined paranoia and anxiety it's not the institutional dysfunction is not so much an issue of some great conspiracy it's the captain has abandoned the ship right oh, to, to yes. charles's point you know people are just leaving all the middle managers who were necessary to you know row uh, stroke stroke to keep the boat moving they're gone the low-level, front-level workers, they're still there when they show up. So there's still someone to open the store, right? But everyone to run the thing is gone. The owners are just taking the money and heading to their, their estate in the country. So what looks to us as institutional stupidity, stupidity or institutional malice is perhaps just a ghost ship just sailing off into the night because there's no one on it. 
Charles, well, let me just you... jump in real quick. Well, yeah, sure. Hold the thought. Ch Jesse, you just reminded me of a story I heard that it sends chills down my spine even when I think about it today. And I think it's a true story. It happened in India or Malaysia or someplace in, in East, East Asia or something. It was a tour of a hot air balloon and these people were in the hot air balloon and it was t but it caught fire and so the guy who was running the hot air balloon he had the presence of mind he understood what was happening he jumped out very quickly and a couple of people just jumped out of the gondola but the more people jumped out the faster the flaming balloon was leaving the earth and of course within a within just a very small window the people who could save themselves had saved themselves and the rest were just stuck in the gondola going straight up in a flaming balloon and they were basically fucked. And so that's kind of what the world feels like right now. Go ahead, Charles. That's a, that's a, great, uh, that's a great metaphor and it feeds into what I was going to say was that one of my points in this piece that, I'm, that I wrote last night that's posted today was the competent leave first because they can see that it's hopeless and that there's no way they can turn it around. You know, the ghost ship, the rudder's broken, the engines, you know, etc. So they leave first. The, the most noble are the next crew, the, to, the people who are idealistic and who, or who feel an obligation to try to save the ship, right? And um, there are people like that, that, that you know, and, and um, you know, that the, they, that the hospital is crumbling around them, but my gosh, I've got to do what I can and I'll work a double shift for the patient's sake, that kind of person, right? Well, then they burn out because no one can no one can sustain that level of, of overwork, liability, um, crushing workload, right? So they burn out and just drop away. Who leaves? Who's left? The incompetent. And and um, and so um, who are still delusional that they're, they're there because they're going to get a pension or something, right? <laughs> Um, or, or in their defense, because they have no other option. Right, that's it. Right, because like, they're well, there not by choice; they're there by compulsion. Yeah, I, I, this is my paycheck. So, mm -hmm. the other point that I that I would like your guys' feedback on, and I, I, I realize neither of uh, well, Mark, you live in a in a suburb of a major city. What I'm kind of seeing, you know, anecdotally is, if you live in, in an urban core that's getting hit with stuff like. Um, people defecating on the sidewalk and, and open criminal activity and, and um, the trash is piling up, you know the system's breaking down, right? But there's a lot, but the majority of the talking heads and the academics and the think tankers and the government managers live in these little islands, right, of, of serenity where the police are still protecting the islands, right? The, the hilltop neighborhood or, you know, the rich neighborhood. And so those people are still in a bubble. They still think it's all fine. And so when their trash doesn't get picked up, and then they, the, the first response will be, well, somebody should do something. And it's like, guess what? There's nobody left yeah. to do something. Yeah. You know, the trash trucks broke down. The mechanics, there's not enough mechanics to keep the trucks running. Half the crews are on um, workers' comp stress claims. So your trash is not going to get picked up. Except I, I think you're describing a 20th century scenario. Uh -huh. And I say this I, I say this in the sense that by the time it reaches what you've described, yeah. it's way, way too late. And yet I think the way you first described it in terms of first the competent leave, then the noble leave, right? I, I think the, the digital world, the 21st century we live in, makes it easier to identify these things way, way before the trash collection stops. And for me, in Toronto, where that happened, and, and it was a, a two-stage, was traffic. That once, A, once I realized that the transportation system was broken, fundamentally broken, could not be fixed, largely due to rapid, dense development of condos without public transit, without any type of transportation upgrade. And then the second piece was hostility that first you have traffic breaking down and then you have pervasive hostility as a byproduct of everyone being stuck in traffic or being stuck on an overcrowded subway or an overcrowded bus or 
waiting for a streetcar forever because you can't fit on all the ones that come. That once I saw that hostility, that's when I was like, this is a failed state. Sure, it doesn't have the looting and you know brigandry and other signs of a 20th century failed state. But the fact that people can't move and are really pissed off that they can't move was enough of a sign to me to get the F out of Dodge and fast. Because it was clear to me that it was a failed state and that things were broken. This is before the pandemic. Right, And so that's where I think that the danger in using 20th century warning signs is that it, 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 it's too late, that you know it's already happened, that you missed the boat. And to a certain extent, the reason I am where I am in the Ottawa Valley is because I almost did miss the boat. That by the time I realized it was time to get out of the city, everything within a three-hour drive had already been colonized by people who had money from the city and took that money from the city to buy up farmland or to buy rural properties. So I had to go four hours out because that's how far the, ra- the the radius had gotten because I was late to the game. Versus now that the pandemic's hit, I mean, Mark, you could tell us about some of your well, yeah, I mean, experiences. I, I've been shopping this summer and I actually was having this very conversation earlier this after. It's like I, I missed the boat, you know, and... Uh, uh, because now it, like the prices have really gone up and I mean we'll have to see what happens we've we've all read this novel before though it's called Atlas Shrugged and whether you I haven't read it proud whether, proud not to have read it how can you be proud not to have read a book I mean the only book you can be proud Come not to have read maybe is Mein Kampf but it's a great book I mean that's the thing that kills me people are like oh my god you read Ayn Rand you must be such a nutcase and then no, no, you no, read no. the book, I, and it's I, like... I don't want to read that book because of all the other people who read that book. And to your uh, point where we started the podcast, all yeah. the things you, all the sources you were listing, I was like, thanks, Mark. I'm glad you consume those sources, so I don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. That's okay. what friendship's all about. My, my brief digression on Ayn Rand is there are two things about Ayn Rand. So ever, most people who love Ayn Rand misunderstand her and love her for the wrong reason, and most people who hate Ayn Rand misunderstand her and hate her for the wrong reason. So, anyhow, I'm completely it's, indifferent and oblivious. It's a never. It's never been a more topical book than now. But the other one that I actually tweeted this morning, just offhand, that should be mandatory reading for everyone is "We the Living." Then I don't want to read it. Okay. Is what was it? "We the Living." We the Living. It was her first novel. It was about oh. uh, a family just after the Russian Revolution, the second revolution. Like there was the first revolution that overthrew the Tsar and it installed a democratically elected um, Alex, uh, uh, whatever his name was. And then he was he over. He wasn't democratically elected, but he was part of the liberal democratic forces okay. that wanted to introduce greater freedoms. It was the Spring Revolution right. versus the Bolshevik Revolution in the fall was authoritarian so and this it, and it was very much designed to overthrow and it's the story of a family a well-to-do sort of upper middle class or lower upper class family and what happened to them and to your point jesse they didn't figure it out until it was too late that they shouldn't have gone back to petrograd and i and that, well, that book leaves chills down my spine when i think about it it's very depressing i mean my anyone needs a reason to be Jew, more depressed Right. As a Jew, my entire ethnic history is getting out at the right time. Right? <laughs> yes. Like, <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean like, to laugh, literally. but it's, yeah, I can, right? I can no, see that. Like, I, have, I have, of my personal family, I mm-hmm. have part of my personal family that got out early, and they're rich and in New York, Yeah. and they're not my side of the family. My side of the family got out late, and they went poor to Montreal. Because, yeah. you know, by them it was too late. They didn't get out with all their stuff. And so, so much of uh, many identities are based on that idea of you got to know when to run. You know, it's funny. My mother, actually, who grew up in Nazi Germany, had the same dynamic when at the end of the war, according to the stories she told us, 
it was all about surrendering to the allies and not the russians you have to you have to get captured by the americans like my grandfather stole a motorcycle and rode that way for three days so he could surrender to the americans when the russians were coming they were they were piled on these trains some of the stories she told me just before she died were just harrowing and they're on the train fleeing the russians and they crossed this river and the rumor was the russians were going to stop at this river and the, all these cries went up of like oh we made it and she said like a gypsy woman or something came up to them and said the russians are going to keep going and they just thought you know maybe maybe we'll get back on the train and it was the middle of the winter too and they got back on the train and they kept going they had nothing and they they got out they got past they got away from the Russians, but they lost everything, of course. And so it's. Uh, but I was going to say it's not a 20th century story of 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 incompetent or the competence because it's happening now. I know people who fled no, Chicago. No, it was the warning signs. It was the right. warning signs that yeah. I felt were 20th century. Okay. That that in the 21st century, there's different warning signs. But that if yeah. you want to get out fast. It, but if you're looking for the 20th century signs, it's too late. Sorry, Charles. Go ahead. No, no. But Mark, go ahead and f finish your anecdote about people leaving, you know, positions of responsibility that keeping the thing glued together. <clears throat> um, I think it's possible I've lost my train of thought about it now. Just. Uh... Although I thought it was the burning balloon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That still well, sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. Yeah. Well. I think uh, this is a fascinating um, discussion, and I want to go back to what, Mark, you were saying to kind of tie it into the change in mass psychology. Now, I think we're all, I think we can all see signs that some kind of mass change has occurred from the pandemic. And there's this now desperate propaganda campaign to restore the old normal, right, which is failing. Is there, though? Because I think there's this mass I don't mean to interrupt, but I feel no, like we're being drilled with this idea of the old normal is gone and you must learn to embrace the new normal. And the new normal is what we tell you it is. And it's a complete difference. It's a complete command economy and just get in line, stand on the dots and ratchet down your expectations for personal freedoms. Your, your first half was reasonable. Your second half was ludicrous. No! Maybe paranoia is the new normal. <laughs> Charles, you were saying? <laughs> no, it's... Um, go to so crappy definitely. tire without a mask on and see how you fare. Okay, go on. Go I on, love Charles. wearing a mask. This is like my childhood <laughs> cops and robbers fantasies come true. Please, oh, Charles. I'm gonna, the well, comments I, I, are going to be a dumpster fire today. Okay, go on. If we have comments, <laughs> that's a good thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> Charles, go ahead. Dumpster fire with tires, I hope. Yeah. So just black stench. <laughs> um, no, no, it's um, the mass psychology I, I see, at least from the official sources, is we're going to reopen and we're going to get a vaccine and it's all going to be great. You know, and, um, and so, yeah, to, to Mark's point, sure, there's going to be more authoritarian controls at the airports and all this stuff to make sure that everybody's safe on the air, on the flights and but those are just like a 9-11 restrictions. Those are for your own good. And, you know, um, this is to keep everybody safe. So, uh, but I think this whole thing of reopening the old economy where everybody's gonna consume more and, and be more prosperous and it's just around the corner. I think that's a very real propaganda because, you know, it's like, what are you gonna say? The, the old normal's dead and prosperity's doomed. Um, I don't think that's um, that's what people sense, but I don't think that's the official line. But I haven't yet seen that that change of consciousness that we're talking that I was talking about that, that uh, in the last Soviet generation, which is um, this thing can, could actually crumble to dust. This thing could actually fail. Yeah, and and well, a, I, I think that's the not yet. Uh, most people are still thinking it's going to hang together somehow. And we're just adapting to some sort of uh, you know, notch down, but it, the, the idea is un, it's going to unravel, and no, the trash is not going to be picked up, and and um, the whole thing's going to fail. I think that's not uh, where most people are yet, but I think it's 
in the future. But given that we're running out of time, let's bring it back to us in terms yeah. of this project we have and in terms of the three of us kind of trying to understand the cyberpunk world that we find ourselves in. You know, we collectively are kind of of the hypothesis that it is collapsing, not that right. it will collapse, that present tense, that's what we're witnessing. And that's right. kind of what this podcast is talking about. Right. But I kind of feel the two of you guys just indirectly or unintentionally contradicted yourselves. Because previously in today's episode, we kind of both acknowledge that either the people in charge are incompetent or the people in charge have fucked off, that they're gone. So therefore, there is no official line. Right? There is no official narrative. There isn't going to be anyone to establish any new normal. Right? There is literally just people taking whatever money they can, rigging the system as best as they can so that as it falls, the money comes towards them. But all of that suggests that there's no official line, no official narrative, no conspiracy, no looming authoritarianism. Lots of looming might is right. Lots of looming violence and use of force. Lots of uh, different rackets and thievery and all sorts of, you know, crazy behavior. But no consensus, right? No clear uh, 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 legitimate government. No clear ability to establish authority in a way that other people respect. And I think that's where we have to remember either Charles's I think very viable, very insightful vision that people will just opt out, that people will just sort of blend away. Or what I've been suggesting, which is the kind of revolt idea that people will just say, no, none of this. And there'll be more and more people on the left, on the right, in the middle, all over, peaceful, not peaceful, who just oppose it, right? I think in both of those cases, there is no official line there is no central power that can impose upon anybody that we actually are moving towards the decentralized world we desire the question fundamentally still remains does amazon be the primary beneficiary of such a world does facebook get to be the central bank in a decentralized way of such a world and i think that's where we have reason to be afraid but again reason to not recycle the 20th century language and uh, tropes because I think we are moving into a world where there is no official line, there is no conspiracy, there is no central government, but there can still be very powerful actors, there can still be very violent actors, and there can also still be lots of great and good and hopeful stuff. And that's why the network state, the Amazon state, the Facebook, the Google state is what I worry about. Because it's not about central control. It's not about an official line. It is about everybody go do whatever you want to do as long as you order from Amazon and like on Facebook. <laughs> and, and that's where I think it is a kind of complicated future that we head into. And part of why I think this podcast provides a valuable role in terms of for us as thinkers and writers who, you know, we're trying to figure this out, but hopefully to our audience because we are providing a different perspective than the propaganda culture or the Potemkin village culture that we, you know, see in terms of the world around us. Can I go first, Charles? As we, yeah. as, as we deliver our, our um, summations. <laughs> so to your point, Jesse, about um, how we've possibly contradicted ourselves, we've talked about this, or I've talked about this on previous episodes before, I mean, we're, we're in loose consensus that we think what we see happening is sort of a transition from the primary configuration of power being the nation state to something else. And I do like the network state idea. I think it's a perfect term to capture it. Now, and it's still kind of up in the air whether it will be a great thing or a bad thing, although it kind of looks a little more dystopian than great at this point. But when, when the configuration of power moved from the church to the nation state during the period of the Enlightenment, when I look at the history books, I feel like that was overall a beneficial 
effect on society. I think it just kind of liberated a lot of a lot of people and unleashed a lot of creativity. So maybe it's not going to be a horrible thing today to have that transition in the long run. But where where I do think it there's an attempt at a unified voice that might feel like a conspiracy or a, or a centralized conspiracy is what I've said before is that the people who occupy the corridors of power now in the nation state think that we can make this seamless transition to the next configuration and still be the ones in charge. And I have this kind of theory that, that it doesn't work that way. When the configuration changes, different players assert leadership in the next configuration. And so I think I'm going to use the word globalism or globalists who are people who sort of occupy the corridors of power in nation states think, well, we're just going to move to this network connected, you know, nexus of that's just going to be nation state squared. It's just going to be this. We're all going to be connected. It's going to be supranational and it'll be all technocratic and we'll still be in charge. Hang on. It's just they think that they're still going to be in charge when this whole disruption occurs and it comes out the other end. And I think the things that make us feel like there's a conspiracy happening are those sort of trial balloons they send up. Like, you know what? This corona pandemic might not be such a bad thing if we just so, pivot into a Green New Deal and use the same the same approach to society. Here's why I can't find any of that credible. There okay. is no they. And, and to be more specific, to use your language, the people who are the elite of the nation state are not unified. They well, are so splintered. They're so splintered. They're so at each other's throats. They're so competitive that you cannot call them a they because they are not homogenous. You could, for example, say, draw a subset of them and say, conservatives around the world but even that there's no unity even if you were to take conservatives they're still so divided and so against each other that the people who comprise the elites or the governing class of the nation state in no way in the english language can you call them a they because they are so diverse they are so divided they are so different in their opinion Okay, that, so that's why I believe Charles's vision, which is they've all fucked off. They're, so they're all they, just abandoning ship. So when they all convene at Davos every year or they don't, Jackson Hole but they or don't whatever. All convene in Davos. Davos is some of them, but there's many of them who have nothing to do with Davos and who hate the schmucks at Davos. This is my point, right? That they, there is no they, that the Davos people is a subset of all these people. But even if you were to take the Davos people, they are not united. They are so divided amongst their different classes and political ideologies. And and that's my point, that the reason the nation state is failing is because Facebook's better at uniting people, because Amazon is better at uniting people. That if society is about elites governing everyone else, then the network state has found a more efficient way of drawing commonality amongst the wealthy or commonality amongst the elite to create more of a consensus to govern versus the clowns who run the nation state, they're too busy fighting amongst themselves to have any sense of unity, and that's why they're losing. That's why there's no they. Okay, I'm going to um, introduce a, an analogy here uh, just as, as my wrap-up, and this is a discussion that we obviously need to pick up on because there's a lot of a, a lot of depth here, you know, um, a lot of topics, but here's my analogy. Okay, it's a classic, the Titanic, right? So the Titanic hits the iceberg and it's, um, unless you're on deck and you see the ice, you know, fall on the, 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 the front deck, then you don't really notice anything, you know, because it's a, a scraping blow that, you know, basically uh, disrupts the uh, steel plates. It doesn't actually tear a gigantic hole. It just, it breaks the plates because they're cold and brittle. And so, um, after a while, you know, the engine, the, this, 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 this ship comes to a, a halt. And so, the people in charge at the bridge, 
right now. They don't have control of everything in the ship. They have some communication. Their approach is tell the band to keep playing, right? Now, while the band is playing, so the control that matters is the propaganda, what's being um, broadcast, right? So you can control that, then you've got a, 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 a quote, official line, even though there's chaos you know, in, in all the control mechanisms. So the band's playing. Meanwhile, the officers who are part of this, um, uh, you know, an elite, if you will, right? That um, they're kind of guiding the first class passengers to um, the lifeboats. And, <laughs> and a lot, most of the first class passengers are wary of it. Like, why should we do this? The ship is fine. It's warm. The lights are on. Why should I get in this cold, um, you know, lifeboat? And then the second class passengers, those that are most, uh, knowledgeable or like, hey, wait a minute, I better get, I better find a, a lifeboat here, right? The steerage passengers are, um, you know, down in the in the depths of the ship, unaware of anything. The few that try to get out are often um, told to go back down at gunpoint, uh, at least later in the scenario. So I think that that's kind of a pretty good analogy. That literally, it depends to to Jesse's point. It depends on which officer is in charge of which uh, four lifeboats what happens on that part of the ship. But there's a general consensus that the first class passengers are gonna get on first, right? And then after that, there's a little bit of nobility here, you know, women and children and all that. <laughs> but it, it, it is, um, it is definitely a, a, a three class. <laughs> oh yeah, well this is a non PC uh, era here, 1912. <laughs> Anyways, I, I think that's a very good analogy for what we're talking about if you're, um, if you're if you're first on the lifeboat, there's not going to be that that lifeboat might be half empty, and then it but then after that it starts getting crowded and people are going to get waved off by gunpoint, and then you're going to have to lash together your own raft. <laughs> so, anyways, that, I I don't know if that's a perfect analogy, but I think it it sums up that there is some control mechanisms in place, but nobody's actually able to fix the problem. The ship is still going to sink. And it's just a matter of managing, you know, who gets saved and uh, who doesn't. Which is why, Mark, I say don't take those elites seriously. You're right that they think that they're going to be able to translate their power. But they can't. They won't. They've already lost. I hope the you're question right. Is, the, the, our worry is the new elite. The Bezos. The Zuckerberg. I'm actually, I'm not that worried about them yet. I just want to be able to, like, travel when I want to travel and you know go out and not have to stand on the dot and you know I, I don't yeah, like that 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 again if we frame that because I think you're raising concerns that are widely held so if we frame that in the conversation we're having it's not that that is being imposed upon you to Charles's point it's that we need a fix and no one can fix it. And because I there's love no that. one who can that's, stand up and yeah. say, here's a way to fix it, we're stuck with these stupid measures that don't work, that frustrate everybody because there's no leadership, there's no power, there's no authority. I get why some would fear that a central authority would rise, but I don't. That, that ship has sailed. My concern now is that the ship is going to sink and there ain't enough lifeboats to go around. <laughs> Um, Mark, I see that your recording uh, icon is red. I hope that doesn't mean that you're not being recorded. No, uh, that, that's a quality icon. On yeah, Jitsi. we're recording. It's just telling us that his connection is oh, not okay. that great. Yeah, we're up over. Yeah, I'm, I've been looking. We're like at an hour. We're just over an hour. Okay. So, to your point, let's see a big ride in the comments section. <laughs> How many people here figured out that there's a commie Jew as part of the Axis of Easy, in addition to a libertarian who yeah, encourages yeah. people to read and ram? Whoa, yes. contradiction! <laughs> Find it out in the comments below. <laughs> Don't forget to hit the like button. Yeah, we're gonna get and banned from Twitter. I mean. Well, don't forget, uh, audience, to um, list any really good parcels in Alberta, okay? I mean, you know, with them. Um, and the price of farmland in Alberta, I'm telling you, none of us can afford it. Since we're, that's true. Since we're here, Charles's new book, A Hacker's Teleology, came out today. 
So go to I go to the company store, Amazon, <laughs> and buy Charles's new book. And I hope to have the audio version out in a couple of months. So all right, we'll see you guys next Thank week. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Downtown, driving all the old men crazy. The boys are back in town.